Welcome to this YSL tutorial. In this video, we're going to talk about using arrays in Excel VBA. So we'll start by explaining what an array actually is and how it differs from a basic data type variable. We'll show you how you can declare a fixed size array and then how to write information to and read data from that array. We'll then move on and show you how you can loop over an array as a slightly quicker way of reading information from it and also how you can clear the contents of an array by erasing it. For the second part of the video, we'll then move on to some more sophisticated array types, including multi-dimension arrays and dynamic arrays. So, as usual, there's quite a lot to do. Let's get started. In VBA, an array is like a variable which allows you to store more than one value using the same variable name. So in previous videos in this series, we've seen lots of examples of using basic data type variables which allow you to hold a single unit of information. So for instance, I could declare a variable which holds the name of the top movie from our list of highest grossing films of 2012. And in fact, I've done that already in the VB editor. I've declared a simple variable that can hold a string and assigned a single value to that variable. But what if I wanted to go a bit further and hold the names of not just the top film, but say the top three or five or even more films? That's where arrays come into play. The first example we're going to show you in this video is how to declare a fixed size or static array that can hold the names of the top three films in this list. Declaring an array is a lot like declaring a variable. So start with dim and then think of a sensible name for your array. I'm going to call mine top three films. And then unlike declaring a variable, open a set of round brackets. Inside the brackets, you have to state how many elements or compartments you want your array to have. And because I know I'm going to store the names of the top three films, I know that my array needs to have three elements. So I can state that by saying the number two. And the reason it's the number two is because by default in VBA, arrays are based from zero. So the first element of the array will be number zero, the second element will be number one, and the third element will be number two. So I can close the parentheses then, and then say what data type I want to store, so I'm going to say as string, just like with a variable, and that's the basic way to declare a simple fixed size or static array. Now if you're not happy about the fact that arrays are based from zero, you can change this at the module level by writing an option statement. So if I prefer my arrays to be based from one instead of zero, I can write option base one at the top of the module. That means that any arrays declared in this entire module have a base of one. So that means that at this point, my top three films array only contains two elements, numbered one and two. So I need to modify this to be top three films three as string. The only acceptable values for option base, by the way, are zero and one. So I can either base from zero or I can base from one. Any other number at all will generate a syntax error. So it's at one or zero, those are your only choices. Now, if you wanted a bit more flexibility in the numbers of your array elements, you can ignore the option based statement altogether and set the lower and the upper bound of the array in the declaration. So rather than just saying top three films three, I could say top three films one to three. And this would completely ignore the option based statement, so I can om omit that altogether. This is by far and away the most reliable way to declare your array elements, state the lower bound and the upper bound in the declaration. And in fact, it allows you to do weird, weird things like start your array elements from any number. So for instance, I could go from 13 to 23 if I really, really wanted to. That would declare an array with 11 elements. Um, I've never seen any reason to do that in the real world. Um, all my arrays either start from 0 or 1, depending on the situation. So I'm going to set mine to 1 to 3, and that's the most reliable way to do it. So now that we've declared our array, we can begin to populate it. And that's again a lot like populating a basic variable, except that with an array, you have to say which element you're populating as you do so. So let's begin by saying top three films, and then I want to populate the first element of the array. So in a set of brackets, I put in the number one and make that equal to, I'm going to say range B3, and that contains the name of the top film in my list. Then the other two elements I can populate quickly and easily by copying and pasting this line and change the element that I'm populating from one to two and three and then say B4 and B5 for the cells. And that will populate the individual elements of the array with the top three films in this list. Reading values from an array is just as simple as populating it 
but again you have to use the element number that you're trying to read. So let's add a new worksheet into the workbook, worksheets.add, and we'll say range A1 on that new worksheet, we'll set its value to the third film in our top three films array. So I'm going to say top three films, open brackets, three. Then I can copy that line, paste it in a couple of times, and then let's put it put in the uh, the other two as well. So range A2, range A3. And I'm going to do this in reverse order. So I'll do number two and number one for the top three films. So that simply reads in three values into the array and spits them back out onto a different worksheet. When you've finished with the array, it's not 100% necessary, but it is good practice to clear its contents. And you can do that by using the erase keyword. So if I say erase top three films, that will clear the contents of each element. And because this is a string array, it sets the elements to empty strings. So there's a basic subroutine which declares a fixed size array, populates its three elements, and then reads the values from those elements before clearing its contents. All we'll do now is give this a quick run through to show you how it works. And it's a good idea at this point to view the locals window. So head to the view menu and choose locals window, because when you step through this subroutine, there's some useful bits of information you'll see in here. So I'm going to click into the subroutine and start by pressing the F8 key. And you can see in here that the locals window shows you the list of your elements of your top three films array. If you expand that, it shows you element one, two, and three shows you their current values and what data types they are. As you step through this routine, you will see each individual element being populated. And then we'll read from those three elements. And then finally, this one will clear out all the elements and set them back to empty strings. So that's a basic idea of how, um, how arrays work when you're running your subroutines. Now with a small array like this one, it's not too much effort to write a single line to populate each element and another line to read from each element. But in the real world, where your arrays are likely to contain hundreds, thousands, even millions of elements, you certainly don't want to be writing a single line to refer to each one. So for the next example, we'll show you how you can write loops to both populate and read from your arrays. So the example we'll do is we'll write a routine that populates a 10 element array and stores the names of the top 10 films in this list. Let's start by writing a new subroutine. I'm going to call this one sub loop over array. And then we can declare our array again. So I'm going to call this one dim top 10 films this time. And I'm going to set the elements from 1 to 10 as a string. I'm also going to have a variable which allows us to count through our loop. So I'm going to say dim counter as long, so a simple long integer. What I can then do is, well, first of all, make sure I've gone back to sheet 1. So I'm going to say sheet 1.activate. And then basically what we're going to do is offset from the top cell in column B, one, two, all the way down to 10 rows down from there and populate the, uh, the, the corresponding element of the array. So back in the VB editor, I'm going to say four counter equals one to 10. So I'm using exactly the same range as the elements of my array. Enter it a couple of times and say next counter. And then to populate the elements of the array, I'm going to say top 10 films open brackets, and rather than stating exactly which number I'm using, I'm simply going to refer to my counter variable. So counter equals range b2 dot offset, and then I'm going to use the counter variable again to tell it how many rows down to, to offset, counter comma zero dot value. So there's the loop that will populate the 10 elements of my array. Now let's loop over the contents of the array and spit them out onto a new worksheet. So I'm going to say worksheets.add again. And this time I'm going to loop, should we loop in reverse order? Let's loop in reverse order. I'm going to say four counter equals 10 to one step minus one. So that decrements the loop counter rather than increments it as usual. So we'll say next counter and then fill in the contents of the loop. We'll say active cell dot value. So that's the, the, the first cell in the new worksheet. We'll make that equal to top 10 films counter. Then I'll make sure I've moved down to the next cell. So I'm going to say active cell dot offset one comma zero dot select. And then finally, before we finish this subroutine, I'm going to say erase top 10 films. And again, that's just good practice. It's not 100% necessary to do. So there's the subroutine written. I'm going to display the locals window again, view locals window. Then I'm going to begin stepping through the subroutine by pressing the F8 key. And you'll see I've got my top 10 films array. It's got 10 elements in it. 
and there they all are. And as I begin stepping through using the F8 key, we'll see each element of the array being populated through this first for next loop. So let's just get to the end of that one reasonably quickly. Keep on pressing F8, and there we go. So now we're going to add a new worksheet. There it is. And I'm, go I'm going to step through in reverse order now. Counter 10 to 1 step, minus 1. So the counter will decrement this time. And we'll read out the value of the 10th element of the array into the first cell. So that will end up with Madagascar as the first value in the, um, in the new sheet. And that was the value of the 10th element. And as we continue going through, we'll see each of the other array elements gets spit out into the new worksheet. So again, let's just step through this one reasonably quickly, get all the way through to the end. And then we see, finally we'll erase the top 10 films, so you'll see all the contents of the top 10 films array gets cleared out and set back to empty strings, and then the subroutine ends. So hopefully you can see using loops is a much more sensible way to go than populating single array elements with single lines of code. If you've got more than three, I think probably even for just three, I probably would have written a loop. I'm that lazy. But loops are certainly the more efficient way to populate and read from arrays with more elements. One small problem with the way I've written my loops in this example is that I've used constant values to refer to the lower and upper bounds of the loop. So that means that if I ever decide to change the way my array is declared, if I decide to change its size, maybe I want to include the extra three films at the end of the list, then I also have to change the numbers in the loop as well. So there's an easier way to handle this. If I change the bounds of my array so that it goes from 1 to 13, so that it includes all the film names currently in the list, what I can then do is exchange these hard-coded constant numbers for functions which read the lower bound and the upper bound of my array. So instead of the number 1 here, what I can do is use the lbound function and pass into the lbound function the name of the array whose bound I want to find, whose lower bound I want to find. So I'm going to say top 10 films. So that will calculate that the lower bound of my top 10 films array is the value of 1. And I can do exactly the same thing then to calculate the upper bound. You can probably guess what the name of the function is. It's called ubound. So ubound top 10 films. If I do the same thing again for the second loop, if I use the lbound function to calculate the lower bound, so exchange that for the number 1, oops, I've missed the L there, and then again for the u bound, I copy that and paste that in in place of the number 10. So this will mean that if I ever change the size of my array now, I don't need to worry about changing the loop counters because they will always pick up on the current lower and upper bounds of the array. So if I just run this one through from start to finish, we'll end up with a new worksheet, sheet 7, and if I look into Excel, I'll have all 13 films listed in reverse order. All of the arrays that we've declared so far have contained multiple elements, but only a single dimension. You can think of a dimension as almost like a direction on the spreadsheet. If I head back to Excel, we've effectively created a single dimension, which is like a column in a spreadsheet. So what if, for the next example, we wanted to store not just a single column, like the film's name, we also wanted to store next to each film its ID number and its release date and its length, etc. What we'd need to do in order to make that work is declare an array which has two dimensions. The first dimension would have, say, 10 elements, letting us store effectively 10 rows of data. And the second dimension would have perhaps five elements, letting us store five units of information next to each row. So to do that, let's head back into the VB editor and we'll create another new subroutine called multi-dimension array. What we can then do is declare an array which has more than one dimension. We can start in the same way as declaring a normal array. So let's say dim, I'm going to call mine top films, and then open a set of parentheses and state the lower and upper bounds of the first dimension. So I'm going to base my array from zero this time, just to make things easier when we start populating it. I'm going to say zero to nine. So it's an array which has effectively 10 rows in it. You can think of the first dimension as a number of rows. If I want to specify a second dimension then, all I need to do is type in a comma and set the lower and upper bounds of the second dimension. And for this one I'm going to say 0 to 4. And that effectively declares, I say, I guess, 5 columns. And that's a fairly neat way to think about it. This two-dimension array is a lot like a table. It's got 10 rows and 5 columns. Things get a little bit tricky when you realise that in VBA you can declare arrays with up to 60 
different dimensions. So you could carry on here and type in another comma and declare the lower upper bounds of the next di dimension and so on and so on and so on. Uh, we're going to keep things much more simple for today at least. We're going to stick to arrays which have just two dimensions for now. The next thing we're going to do is state what data type we're going to store in this array. And this is where we run into another small problem. If you look back at the Excel spreadsheet, you recognize that each different column has a different data type. So there's some numbers, some text, some dates, more numbers and more text. So that's a little bit tricky because you can't declare different data types for different dimensions or different elements in a dimension. What we'll do instead here, for the sake of convenience, is use the variant data type. So that means that VBA will assign the correct data type as the array gets populated. Just to demonstrate the basics of how to populate a multi-dimension array, let's populate the first row by hand. So we're going to say top films, open brackets. And now, because we've got more than one dimension, we have to specify the element for each dimension that we're populating. So the first unit of information in our top films array will be 0, 0. And I'm going to set that to be equal to range A3 dot value. So that will store the ID number of the first film in the first element of the array. Back in the VB editor, let's just make a quick copy of this line and paste it in four times just to make life easier. And then for each other unit of information in the first row, I'm going to say top films are 0, 01, 0, 02, 0, 03, and 04. And then use column B, C, D, and E. And now I'm just going to use the locals window to watch what happens when I populate this array. So I'm going to view the locals window and start stepping through this routine using the F8 key. So as soon as I do that, I can see that my array has been um, uh, listed in the locals window. And if I expand the top films array, it shows me the number of elements in the first dimension. So zero to nine, so 10 different elements. But can you see that each one of those elements actually has its own nested set of elements? So if I expand top films zero, it shows me that that has five elements within it. And this is how, how multi-dimensional arrays work. I mentioned that it's quite difficult to conceive of how a, a three-dimension or a four or a 60-dimension array works. But rather than trying to think of them in terms of 3D space or 2D space, think of them in terms of a nested tree. So if I had a third dimension, top films zero, zero would have its own little nested set of units of information and so on and so on and so on. Anyway, as we begin stepping through using the F8 key, we'll see that for each unit of information that we populate, just watch what happens to the value of 00, zero and its data type gets stored in the correct element. So the value 1 gets stored in top film 00, zero and it says variant double. So it works out that this data type of the, uh, the first piece of information is a double. If I press F8 for the next line, this is going to be the name of the film. So you can see that the value of that film is Marvel's The Avengers. So if I press F8 there, you'll see that this one gets converted to a string. And so on and so on and so on. So this is a date, and then another double, and another string. And we could carry on doing this, although it would get very, very tedious very quickly to populate every single element of this array by hand. So what we'll do now, when I've ended the subroutine, is write a loop that will populate this array with the data for the top 10 films in this list. So let's remove the locals window and let's clear out all these lines of code that populates the first row by hand. And instead we'll have a couple of extra variables that allow us, us to loop over the various cells. We're going to have two separate counter variables this time. I'm going to call mine um, dim dimension one as long. And then on the same line, comma dimension two as long. Then I'm going to start looping by saying for dimension one equals, and to begin with, I'm just going to hard code the numbers. I know I said this was bad practice, but just for the sake of convenience here, I'm going to say equals zero to nine, and then close that loop by saying next dimension one. And then inside that loop, what I'm going to do is say for dimension two equals zero to four, and then close that loop inside there. So I'm going to say next dimension two. If I could spell dimension, that would help. There we go, next dimension two. Now, inside this pair of nested loops, what I can do is say top films, open brackets, dimension one, comma, dimension two, equals, and then refer to the value of the cell that I want to store in that dimension. So the easiest way to do this 
is to refer to the first cell in my uh, array of data, that's A3, and offset from that point. So I'm going to say range A3 dot offset dimension 1, comma, dimension 2 dot value. So the first time this inside this loop, the first iteration of this, this pair of loops, dimension 1 will be 0 and dimension 2 will be 0. So that will populate element 0, 0 of top films by offsetting 0 rows down and 0 columns to the right from range A3. Effectively, it populates it with the value of cell A3. Let's display the locals window again just before we start stepping through this one, just to prove that it is actually working as we intend. So as I start pressing F8 to step through, I'm just going to expand the top films array and expand the first element of the first dimension. And as we continue to step through now, we will see um, dimension 1 is 0 and dimension 2 is 0. So the first element of the array will get populated with the value of cell A3. Then we'll go on to the next element of the second dimension. <laughs> Being very careful to be explicit about what words I use here. Then Marvel's The Avengers gets populated and you'll see that this essentially first row of data gets populated. Then we're going to exit the inner loop dimension 2 and move on to the next iteration of the outer loop dimension 1. So that will go to um, effectively top films 1, 0 and it will populate the first element of the second dimension of the second element of the first dimension of the array. Um, I'm going to get bored doing this and I'm, I'm going to trip myself up in a moment by, by trying to describe this in detail. So all I'm going to do now is press F5 just to run all the way through to the end of that subroutine. You can see clearly that this is populating each cell um, properly. What I'm actually going to do is set a breakpoint on N sub. So if I press F5 that will run everything all the way through to N sub but it hasn't yet ended. So what I can do now is expand each of these different elements and show you that every single other um, piece of information has been populated in the array all the way through to the tenth element of the first dimension and the fifth element of the second. Now I mentioned earlier that it's bad practice to hard code the range of your loop counters because if you decide to change the bounds of your array then you'll also need to update these and it's easy to forget to do that. I speak from bitter experience. So I showed you that you can use the L bound and U bound functions to calculate the lower and upper bounds of an array. And when we're working with multiple dimensions, L bound and U bound are a little bit more complicated to use. So let's start by calculating the lower bound of the first dimension of the top films array. So I'm going to replace the value zero here with the L bound function open some brackets and I have to say which array I'm calculating the lower bound of so that's going to be top films but I also have to say which dimension I'm calculating the lower bound of for that array so I can type in a comma there and say the number one and that calculates the lower bound of the first dimension of the top films array and I can do the same thing here with the U-bound functions. Rather than to 9, I can replace that with U-bound, open parentheses, top films, comma, 2. So that calculates the, uh, sorry, 1 again. Oh, sorry, getting ahead of myself. That's, uh, that calculates the upper bound of the first dimension of the top films array. Then I need to do the same thing for the inner loop here. So let's just quickly copy and paste the L-bound function from there. So I can replace the value 0 with L bound top films 2, the lower bound of the second dimension of the top films array. And then copy the U bound function and paste that over the number 4. And again, replace the number 1 with the number 2. So that calculates the upper bound of the second dimension of the top films array. Phew. So having done all of that now, I'm going to set a quick breakpoint on N sub again by clicking into this little uh, grey bar to the left hand side. View the locals window again. And then I'm going to begin stepping through using the F8 key and just expand my top films array and the, uh, the first element of the first dimension. So as I step through, we'll find that the L bound of top films dimension 1 is 0. You can see that there. And the upper bound of the first dimension of top films is 9. So this will be looping through essentially in the same way as it did before but it's now more resistant to changes. If I modify the bounds of my array, the L bound and U bound functions will happily work out what the new upper and lower bounds are. I'm just going to press F5 now to run all the way through to N sub, but pause at that point, just so that you can see that all of the other dimensions get populated in exactly the same way as previously. And then I can end the subroutine 
and remove my breakpoint. Now that we know how to do this, it's fairly trivial to loop over the array and read all its values back out somewhere as well. So I'm going to close down the locals window just for the moment, and same thing again, we're going to add a new worksheet, so worksheets.add, and then I'm going to loop over the array in exactly the same way, but read its values into a new set of cells. So the loop will be essentially exactly the same. I'm going to copy the entire thing, and then instead of reading values into the array, I'm going to simply reverse this line. So instead of saying top films dimension 1 dimension 2 equals something, I'm going to replace that, cut it, paste it in at the start of the line instead, make sure I've got an equal sign in between the value of the cell and reading the value from the, from the array, and instead of referring to range A3, I'm going to use active cell. So essentially that will start reading data in from the very first cell of the new worksheet that I've just added. Let's also make sure that we clear the contents of the array by using erase top films. There's nothing special that you need to do there with, uh, with erase. That will clear every element of every dimension of the array in one go. And then I'm going to set another breakpoint again. Um, in fact, I'm going to set a breakpoint just before, uh, just on the erase line, so just before you erase the data from the array. And then use the locals window and press the F5 key to run the, uh, the entire subroutine all the way up to my breakpoint. So just so you can see that all the array elements are populated at this point, there they all are. Then if I press F8 to erase the top films array, it sets them all back to an empty data type. So because this is a variant, previously when we had string data types, it set, set the values back to an empty string. When it's a variant, it sets it back to the value empty, which is slightly different. So that's the end of the subroutine. That's how you can loop over a multidimensional array using simple nested loops. So far, all the arrays that we've used have had a fixed number of elements in each dimension. So they're referred to as fixed size or static arrays. What if you don't know how large the array needs to be? So for instance, what if we weren't able to predict how many rows we had in our list of films or indeed how many columns we had either? What we can do is create a dynamic array, which can be resized according to the size of data you need to store in it. So back in the VB editor, what we're going to do is copy the entire subroutine that we've just written. So there's fairly few changes that we actually need to make in order to make this work. So I've copied it, I'm going to paste it in. I'll obviously need to change the name of the subroutine as well. I'm going to call it dynamic multidimension array. And all I'm going to do at this point is remove any lower and upper bounds of the different dimensions of the array. So we're going to say top films, open and close brackets, as variant. The brackets are still important, you must make sure those are there, otherwise you'll just declare a basic data type variable. So now that we've declared this variable, it hasn't actually been dimensioned yet. We don't have a size for any dimension in the, in the array. What we need to do now is redimension that array using the redim statement. Now before I can redimension the array, I need to know how many elements I want to put in each of its dimensions. So I'm going to use my dimension 1 and dimension 2 variables to do this, as they're already here. I'm going to set dimension 1 to be essentially the count of the number of rows in my data on sheet 1. So in fact, let me make sure that I've gone to sheet 1 first, because so I'm not quite sure that I'm definitely going to be there, having created a separate worksheet. So sheet 1.activate, make sure we're in the correct place. And then we can say dimension 1 equals range a3, comma, range a2 dot end excel down try that again excel down dot cells dot count now that will simply count the number of cells in the range a3 to a2 dot end excel down which is in this case cell a15 so it simply counts how many cells are in that list and it will return the number 13 now bear in mind that I want to base my arrays from zero, so rather than having the, the dimension 1 and having um, 1 to 13, I want it to be 0 to 12. So what I'm going to do back in the VB editor is just subtract 1 from the result of that property, and that will give me the, the bounds, the upper bound of dimension 1. I can do dimension 2 in a similar way. I can say uh, dimension 2 equals range, and this time I'm going to go for a2, comma, range, a2 dot end xl to right dot cells dot count minus one 
So what this will do is go from cell A2, which is the first title cell, to range A2 to index cell to right, and that will select or, or refer to that block of five cells. Now I've subtracted one from the result to give me an upper bound of four. So now that I have those values stored, what I can do is redim the top films array. And I can do that by saying redim top films, open parentheses, and I'm going to say zero to dimension one, comma, zero to dimension two. Close parentheses. Now, I'm not going to state a data type. In fact, you can't change the data type of an array when you redimension it. So it will remain as a variant. So we're just going to redim top films, zero to dimension one, zero to dimension two. And this will now do exactly the same job as the previous routine, except this will be able to handle different numbers of rows and different numbers of columns. So just to see how this one works, let's view the locals window. And let's begin stepping through using the F8 key. So you can see that I've got top films, which is a variant array, but it doesn't have any elements yet. I can't expand it at this point. So if I continue to press F8, I can calculate the number of um, rows, effectively rows minus one, which is 12, and columns minus one, which is four. And then at this point, when I read dim top films, we'll see that it suddenly has a number of elements. If I click the plus symbol, you'll see that it has uh, 13 elements in the first dimension and five elements in the second dimension. And then I'll continue to populate these going through in exactly the same way as previously. So I'm, just, I'm not going to go through the whole thing this time, I'm just going to hit uh, play to run the whole thing and then just go back to Excel quickly so you can see that it um, copies out all the values from that array onto a brand new worksheet. So this is one way to create and populate a dynamic multi-dimension array. But when you're talking about storing a range of cells in an array, this method is completely over the top. What I'm going to do here is copy this entire subroutine once again and paste it in down below. And then I'm going to change its name to quick dynamic multidimension array. And then what I'm going to do is remove most of the code from here, everything from the dimension variables all the way down to, but not including your race. I want to keep that in there just for good practice reasons. And I'm also going to re-enter sheet one dot activate. Okay, so I've got a, an array here that does not have any dimensions at this point. What I would like to do is simply store a range of cells directly in that array. And I can do that by saying top films equals, and then refer to the range of cells that I want to store in there. So the range of cells that I want to store is everything from cell A3 down to the end of the list in a downwards direction and to the end of the list in a right direction. So this is going to assume that every single cell is populated. We don't have any gaps in the list, but we're just going to store that entire block of cells in our array. And I can do that by saying range A3, so that's the top left corner, comma, range A2 dot end XL down dot end XL to right, close two sets of brackets, and that will do the job. <laughs> which is amazing, isn't it? If I just view the locals window and step through this one, just so you can see, if I use F8 to step through, so we've got our top films array declared, but it does not have any elements yet. Go to sheet one and then populate that top films array. And it suddenly gets populated with all the values of all the elements, which is pretty neat. Um, one thing to watch out for, it doesn't matter what option base statement you use in your module. In fact, I haven't even got one in this module, so it should be basing our arrays from zero. When you use this technique to populate a multi-dimension array, it actually bases its arrays, array dimensions from one. So I've got one to 13 and one to five. So that's just one little thing to watch out for, but it's certainly a much quicker way than calculating the size of the array and redimensioning it and then populating each element one by one. This is a far more efficient technique to use. One other interesting thing to note about dynamic arrays is what happens when you erase them. So I've got to the point where I've populated this dynamic array. I'm going to press F8 to erase it. So if I just press F8 to execute this line, what you'll see happen here is that whereas previously the individual element elements of the array got set back to their default values, here with a dynamic array, the entire array gets deallocated. So this actually frees up the memory space taken up by the allocation of that array.
So erase works differently with dynamic arrays than it does with static ones. And this is true for the previous example as well, by the way. If I go back to the previous one where we were redimensioning our array, if you redim the array, then it's a, it's a dynamic array, obviously, because we haven't specified its dimensions here. So I'm just going to set a quick break point on the erase line and press F5 to run up to that point. So you can see that all the array elements have been populated. If I press F8 now to execute this erase line, you'll see again that the whole thing gets deallocated, freeing up the memory space taken up by it. Now with this quick dynamic multi-dimension array example that I created earlier, although I showed you quick ways to populate the array, I didn't show you the quick way to read the value back out. So again, just as we've avoided looping to populate it, we can avoid looping to read the values out. All we need to do is create a new place for the uh, for the values to go. I'm going to say worksheets.add. And then I need to specify what range of cells I want to read the array into. So I can do that by saying range. And then the top left-hand corner of the range I want to read the values into is going to be the active cell. That's range A1 on the new worksheet. Now the bottom right-hand corner of the range is going to be from the active cell, dot offset. And then the number of rows that I want to move down from there is going to be equal to the upper bound element of the first dimension of this top films array. I know that the, any, any array that gets populated with a range of cells is always a two dimension array. So what I'm going to do here is say U bound, open parentheses, top films, comma, one. So that's the first dimension of that array. Now we saw earlier on that when you populate arrays like this by storing a range of cells, that they are based from 1. So the upper bound element will be 13. I don't want to offset 13 rows down, I only want to offset 12. So I'm going to minus 1 to uh, calculate the first parameter of offset. So that's the number of rows I want to move down. And then a very similar thing to do the column offset. That's going to be U bound, top films, comma 2. So it's the second dimension, close brackets, minus 1 close brackets. Phew. So that's the range of cells I want to um, I want to populate. Um, close an extra set of round brackets then and say dot value equals top films. So it's a bit of a mouthful. Sorry, let me just uh, squeeze all that into one single page. I can't quite squeeze it all, all onto one single screen width. So just to explain that again, active cell is the top left hand corner. The bottom right hand corner that I'm going to populate is all of this. So it's from the active cell, offset that number of rows down and that number of columns across and change the value of all those cells to be equal to the top films array. So if I just quickly step through this routine just so we can see this happening and I'm going to use the F8 key to do this. So F8, F8, F8. I've populated the array. There's all the values populated. I'm going to add a new worksheet. It's worksheet number 12. Then I'm going to populate all those cells in one go. And if I just quickly switch back into Excel, you'll see that that is what has happened. Sheet number 12 populated with all the values from that array. So it's an incredibly quick way to transfer data into and out of an array when you're using a range of cells. Now, one of the reasons that this technique in particular can be so useful is because of how much time it can save you when you're performing calculations across a large range of cells. So let's say, for example, we wanted to perform a set of calculations on our film lengths. If we weren't using arrays, what we would probably do is process the list of cells one by one, maybe in a do until loop until we reach the end, or in a for each loop. And we process each cell one by one, perhaps read its contents into a variable, perform a calculation, and then read the answer out into another cell. And we do that on a one by one basis for every single cell in that range. And that can get quite inefficient. So what we'll do instead is demonstrate how to do this using an array. We'll read the entire contents of this range of cells into an array in one single step. And then we'll loop over the array and perform the calculations on each value, storing the answers in the array. And then finally, read all the answers out into a range of cells in one single step. So let's start that by going back to the VB editor. And we'll begin another new subroutine here. I'm going to call mine sub calculate with array. And then we're ready to start writing the code that will perform this sequence of actions. So the calculation that we're going to perform is going to convert the film's runtime in minutes into hours and minutes. 
So for each film that we encounter, we're going to take its runtime in minutes there, 143, and separate it into the number of whole hours, so the number 2 will go into, into column F, and then the number 23, which is the remaining minutes, will go into column G. So that means that we're going to have two separate dynamic arrays, one that will hold the original values, and one that will hold and output the answers. So in the VB editor, we'll declare a dynamic array, dim film lengths, as um, variant. It's got to be a variant because it's a dynamic array. We can't set any data type other than variant. So um, it's a dynamic array, so we haven't specified a set, of, a, a set of dimensions or number of elements. That's the first one. The next one will be called dim answers. And in a very similar way, it's going to be dynamic and it's going to be a variant. What we can do then is head on to sheet one. So we'll say sheet one dot activate. And then we can set what film lengths refers to by saying film lengths equals range d3, comma, range d2, dot end, open brackets, Excel down. And that will store the entire list of film lengths in that array. Let's just give that a quick test. You're viewing the locals window. So view locals window and use the F8 key to step through. So film lengths gets populated with all the values of the film length, so 143 for the first film, and so on. So the next step is to redimension our answers array to have the same number of elements in its first dimension as the film lengths array. So I want to essentially to go from 1 to 13, because that's how many films I have. So I'm going to stop running the subroutine at that point, and I'm going to, actually to make life easier, I'm going to have a separate variable that calculates the number of elements in the first dimension. So let's say dim, I'm going to have dimension 1 again, as we had last time, dimension 1 as long. What I can then do is say dimension 1 equals u bound open parentheses, film lengths, comma 1, and that will store the number of elements in the first dimension of the film lengths array. We know that because we're storing a range in the film lengths array, it always creates a two-dimension array, essentially the number of rows and the number of columns. So this makes sure that we get the number of rows rather than the number of columns. What we can then do is say readim answers, open brackets, and the elements in the first array is going to go from 1 to dimension 1. So it's the same number of rows as the first array, film lengths. The second dimension is going to have two columns effectively, so I'm going to say 1 to 2. And that will redim the answers array to have exactly the same number of rows as the film lengths. What we can now do is start looping over the film lengths array and performing calculations on its values. So to do that, we're going to have another variable which holds the um, the counter. So I'm going to say I'm going to have another long variable counter as long, and then we can say for counter equals one to dimension one. So we might as well use that variable we've calculated it earlier on. We've calculated the upper bound of film lengths, and then we can say next counter, and then start performing the calculations inside that loop. The first thing we'll do is calculate the number of whole hours for the running time. So to do that, I'm going to store an answer in the answers array. And the element that I want to populate is in the counter of the first dimension. So it's the first time around, it will be populating row number one. And I want to populate the first element of the second dimension. So effectively, the first column and the first row. So answers counter one equals. And I want to basically divide the number of um, minutes for the running time of the film um, by 60 and return the whole number portion of that. So there's a function called int that guarantees I'll return a whole number. And inside there, I can perform the calculation that will be film lengths, open brackets, counter, comma, 1, close brackets, divided by 60. So that returns the whole number of hours for the length of a film. The next thing to do is say answers counter comma two. So populate the second column of the first row of the answers array equal to. And then for this, I'm going to say film lengths counter comma one. So remember that the film lengths array only has a single column. And I'm going to use the mod operator or the modulus. And this returns the remainder of dividing one number by another. So that effectively returns the remainder of the runtime in minutes. So for the first film, we will get um, 2 hours and 23 minutes.
So at that point, it's probably worth another quick little test here. If I view the locals window again and start stepping through using the F8 key. So we see our two arrays that don't have any elements yet. So then the film length gets, uh, gets populated with all the original film lengths. And there they all are. And then we redimension answers to have the same number of elements, same number of rows at least as film lengths. And then we're going to start looping to populate the answers. So here's answers 1, 1. When we execute this line here, that should be populated with a number 2. And there it is. Then the next line should populate this element with a number 23. And there it is. And then we simply carry on going over that array until we've populated all of the answers for all of the films. So I'm just going to hit the reset button now at this point. And the next job is to spit out all of the answers into another range of cells. To do that, of course, we need to specify the range of cells that we want to populate. And to do that, I'm going to specify from range F3 to column G, so it's going to be two columns across, down to the same height as the number of elements in the array. So to do that, let's head back to the VB editor, and I'm going to say range. F3 is the top left cell, comma, range, F3, dot offset. The number of rows I want to offset down is equal to dimension 1 minus 1, comma. The number of columns I want to offset to the right is 1. Dot value equals answers. And it's as simple as that. We should also make sure that we erase film lengths and erase, uh, erase answers as well. That will free up the memory space taken up by those. And then that should be enough to return all of our answers. Let's give it a quick run. Hit the, the run button or press F5. Head back to Excel. And there's our set of answers, giving us exactly the set of values that we wanted. So there's a wonderful way to process a sequence of calculations for a range of cells. And in the real world, rather than just processing 13 rows, you might be talking about 13,000 or 130,000 rows. Of course, you won't notice much speed increase by comparing techniques for just 13 rows. But if you compare it against that much larger number, this technique of reading all the values into an array, calculating all the answers in an array, and then spitting everything out in one single step, will be way more efficient than doing it cell by cell by cell. For all of the dynamic arrays that we've used so far, we've been able to work out exactly what size of array we need to create and redimension it in a single step. But what if you need to have an array which can be resized as your subroutine goes along so you can't predict how large your array needs to be when you first redimension it? Well, we can do that too using the redim statement. And to demonstrate that, we'll write an example which loops over the collection of films in our list. So we'll loop over the collection of cells in column A and for each film we'll test whether it's um, an action film, perhaps. And if it's an action film, we would like to add an element to a dimension of the array and store those details in that new element. So to get started, let's head back to the VB editor and we'll create another new subroutine. We'll call this one sub resize dynamic array. We'll declare an array. I'm going to call mine action films and it's going to have open and close brackets as a variant. And I'm also going to declare a variable that will allow us to loop over the collection of cells. So I'm going to say dim r as range. I'll make sure that we've gone to sheet 1, sheet 1 that activate. And then I'm going to say for each r in range a3, comma range a2, dot end, excel down. Next r and then we can work out what to do inside that loop. First of all, we need to test if the film that we're looking at is an action film. So we can do that by checking for the value of the cell that's offset one, two, three, four columns to the right from cell R. So in the VB editor, we'll say if R dot offset zero comma four dot value value equals action then couple of blank lines, end if. Don't forget that when you're comparing strings in VBA that this is case sensitive, so make sure that you spell either action with all the same capital letters or alternatively, use one of the case functions. So if I say L case, R dot offset 0, 0,4 value equals 
action spelt with all lowercase letters that will make sure that I don't have to worry about what case I'm, I'm storing my film types in. Now that I know I'm working with an action film, what I'd like to do is add another element to one of the dimensions of the action film's array. And ideally, I'd like to do that by working out what the current upper bound element of one of its dimensions is, and simply adding one to it. But unfortunately, I can't do that at this point, and that's because the action film's array is still empty, so it doesn't have any dimensions or any elements. If I try to use U-bound here, it would fail and give me a runtime error. So one solution would be to create a single element in one dimension by redimming action films before I begin my loop. But it's probably just easier to keep track of the number of action films that I've encountered and use that to redimension the correct number of elements. So let's do that version instead. I'm going to say dim action counter as long. And then inside this if statement, I can say action counter equals action counter plus one. So the first time I encounter an action film, the action counter will go from 0 to 1, and I can then use that value to redimension the action film's array. So I'm going to say redim action films, open parentheses, and the first dimension I'm going to set from 1 to action counter. If I can spell that properly, action counter, comma. The second dimension, I'd like to store the values for five different columns. So I'm going to set the second dimension from one to five, and that will stay fixed. It's always going to be one to five. Now that I've done that, I need to populate essentially that row of, uh, of the array with the appropriate values from the spreadsheet. So to do that, I'm going to be looping over the second dimension of my action films array. I'm going to have another loop counter variable up here. I'm going to say loop counter as long. And then inside this if statement, I'm going to have a for loop counter equals one to five. I know I've said previously that this is bad practice. We should be testing the lower bound and the upper bound of that dimension of the array. But because I know that this is always going to be from one to five, I can get away with cheating essentially here. So inside that loop, let me just close the loop off. Let's say next loop counter. What we can then do is populate the, the appropriate element of the action films array. To do that, I've got to specify which element I want to populate. So let's say action films, open brackets, and the number of the element of the first dimension is going to be equal to the action counter. So it's basically the number of the row, action counter. Then the number of the element of the second dimension is equal to whichever column I'm looking at, which is basically equal to the loop counter. So let's say loop counter, and then close parentheses, and we want to make that equal to r.offset zero rows up or down, and the number of columns I want to offset to the right is equal to loop counter minus one, close brackets, dot value, and that will begin to populate this array. So let's have a quick look at what happens when we start to do this. If I view the locals window and start stepping through this routine using the F8 key, I'll get to the point where we um, redim the action films array for the first time. So that creates a single element in the first dimension and five elements in the second dimension. And we'll start looping through and start to populate the values of those elements because the first film that we encounter is an action film, Marvel's The Avengers. And then we move on to the next cell in our list. And the next cell is also an action film. The next film is actually also an action film. So we go into this loop again, increment the action counter, and then we'll redim action films to have two elements in its first dimension. So just watch what happens in the locals window when I do this. So the action films array is redimensioned. If I expand that, you can see it's now got two elements in the first dimension. If I expand the second element, you see that it's currently empty because we haven't populated it yet. But there's a big problem. If I expand the first element, unfortunately, we'll see that it has also lost all of its previous values. So that's not particularly useful, is it? The problem is that whenever you redimension an array, it clears the contents of any elements in that array. So I'm going to stop running through my subroutine at this point, and we'll look at the solution to this basic problem. Actually, telling the array to remember its old values is pretty straightforward. You just need to add a single keyword after redim called preserve. And that's sufficient to make the array remember its old values every time you redimension it. However, that does introduce one other small problem. 
Now if I try to run this subroutine at this point, it will fail on the line that we've just uh, changed. And the reason it does that is because when you add the preserve keyword to a readim statement, you can only redimension the last dimension of the array. And here what I'm trying to do, if I just reset this, here what I'm trying to do is redimension the first dimension of the array. So what that means we have to do is flip around the way we consider the rows and columns for this array. I need to make the action counter variable used in the second or the last dimension. So I'm going to remove 1 to 5 or move 1 to 5 to be the first dimension. That means now that I can redimension this dimension. What I then also need to do is consider how I'm storing values in the array because this there's a mismatch now in the um, in the loop counter and the action counter variable. I need to make sure that I'm specifying the loop counter element first followed by the action counter second. I don't need to modify the offsets of the cells, this is still going by row and column, but effectively now for the action films array we're going column to row rather than row to column as last time. Okay, so having done all of this, what we can now do is start stepping through using the F8 key. And we'll see that the first time we redim the action films array, it creates five separate units of information each with a single element. So we'll see that we populate, for the first film we populate the individual values, there's one, there's the Avengers, there's the release date of the film, it's running time, and it's type. Once we finish with the first film, we then go to the next film in the list, which is also an action film. So we find we add uh, one to the action counter, and then we're going to redim, but preserve the action films array. So when I do that, We'll see action films gets collapsed up. If I expand it this time, we've still got the five units of information, the five elements of the first dimension. But if I expand each one now, you'll see that each one of these five units has two subunits. So you'll see that as I step through this one now, we'll get the number two appearing here, and the number, uh, the name of the next film, and so on and so on and so on. So basically, each element of the first dimension behaves like a category of information rather than as a single film, a single record. I'm just going to press F5 to run to the end just to prove that it does uh, work all the way through to the end. Um, and that's how you can preserve the values of an array when you redimension it. In the last example, we've effectively switched from thinking of our arrays as rows and columns to columns and rows. So we've sort of transposed the way that we populate our array. Now if we're going to read the values of the array into a worksheet, we also have to be careful about how we do that. If we were going to loop over the array, that's fairly easy to control. We can just write our nested loops in the correct way to loop over the rows first and then the columns. But if we were trying to read it out in a single step, as we have done in previous examples, we need to be a little bit more careful. Let's add another worksheet at the end. So we'll say worksheets.add, and then I'm going to specify the range of cells I'm going to read my array into. So I'm going to say range, open parentheses, active cell, that's the top left-hand corner, and the bottom right-hand corner will be active cell.offset. The number of rows is going to be equal to the first dimension of the array, or the number of elements in the first dimension, minus one. So that's going to be 4, comma, and then the number of elements in the second dimension, minus 1, I can calculate using U-bound. So that's U-bound, action films, comma, 2 for the second dimension, minus 1. Close to, so that's a brackets and say dot value equals action films. Okay, so once I've done that, if I run the subroutine, we'll end up with a new worksheet which has essentially the transposed version of the values in my array. So it's got the ID numbers in the first row, the film names in the second row, and so on and so on. Ideally what I'd like is this data presented in the correct way, so the numbers in the first column, names in the second, dates in the third, and so on. Unfortunately, there's a convenient way to do that with an array. First of all, let's modify the range that we're outputting our array into. I don't want it to be four rows and, or sorry, five rows and a different number of columns. I want it to be a set number of columns and a variable number of rows. So I'll remove the four comma at the start, and then after I've calculated the upper bound and subtracted one, I'm going to say uh, comma four. 
so that's the number of columns to offset. What I can then do as well is, rather than just um, reading out the value of the action films, I can use the transpose function to do that. I can say application dot transpose, open parentheses, action films, close parentheses. So that takes the array and flips it from columns to rows into rows to columns or vice versa. So having done all that, if I run the subroutine again, I'll end up with another new worksheet, but this time the worksheet will be in the correct alignment. So it's rows and columns rather than columns and rows. If you've enjoyed this training video, you can find many more online training resources at www.wiseowl.co.uk.